please give a warm welcome to Dr. Benjamin Griffin. So you can look no further than your hands, your pockets, your purses, your backpacks, um, to see how much the human electronics relationship has evolved over the past two decades. With its impacts on society in terms of behavior, even biochemistry, musculoskeletal systems, it's arguable that the modern uh, smartphone is the pinnacle of the evolution of the human electronics relationship. So we could debate this assertion and, and its validity, um, but, but what is certainly true is we can anticipate that microelectronics innovations will create new opportunities uh, to revolutionize uh, this relationship between humanity and our electronics. So hello, and welcome to the BiodeBits Tech Panel Session. So I am Benjamin Griffin. I'm a program manager in the Microsystems Technology Office here at DARPA. Um, in today's panel session, we're going to be exploring the future of this relationship between humanity and its electronics through the lens of biosensing, looking at the challenges of how do we transmit uh, and monitor information about life processes uh, within the body through biosensing. So I'd like to welcome to the stage my uh, colleague and fellow program manager from the uh, Biological Technology Office, uh, Dr. Paul Sheehan, who will go ahead and introduce our panelists. Fantastic uh, introduction. All right, so we have uh, three panelists uh, for you today. First up uh, is uh, Professor Ken Shepard. Uh, Ken Shepard is a Lau Family Professor of Electrical Engineering and Biomedical Engineering at Columbia University. Uh, he began his career at IBM Research designing high-performance CMOS processors for the mainframe. Ken has started multiple venture-based startups across the spectrum from computer-aided design to molecular diagnostics. Um, over to you, Ken. for my slide to come up here. Good morning, everyone. Okay, so for real-time in vivo biosensing, um, both wearable and implantable technologies are required. One of the key challenges to um, the here is volumetric efficiency. The amount of function that can be integrated in a certain amount of volume. Volume is at a premium. Related to this, of course, is energy efficiency, how much energy the system can consumes to achieve this function. Fortunately, we have a technology already that is driving both volumetric and energy efficiency, and that's CMOS, which has been riding the Moore's Law scaling curve for the last 50 years and has an enormous established manufacturing infrastructure that also drives down costs. Communications and computation applications have been driving CMOS technology but there's much more potential here. The enormous capabilities of CMOS give bioelectronics a significant edge up as a foundation for both wearable and implantable devices. Now, this doesn't mean that the only way you can interface to the biological is electrical. It doesn't mean that you can, that, uh, you can only power and communicate electrical or RF. You can also use light. Um, you can also use acoustics. But these require more than more additions to the base CMOS technology. That is new materials that be integrated on top of the base CMOS platform. This also means we have to innovate in packaging as well, often putting the chips themselves into unusual form factors. So what does the base CMOS give you? Basically amazing function at very little volume. So to give you a flavor of this kind of volumetric efficiency, what I showed on my slide here is up in the top left corner is a brain implant device. This is a chip that's designed to lie on the cortical surface of the brain right below the skull. The device is only 15 microns thick. It can be inserted with a small slit in the skull, which then heals right over. So we've done this in animals. At this thickness, when we thin the chip down to this thickness, the integrated circuit chip itself is mechanically flexible, kind of has the consistency of a piece of mylar film and conforms to the brain surface. So you see in the center there at the top, but this is what the chips look like when they're diced from a 200 millimeter silicon wafer. So we post-process the devices at the wafer scale. We add titanium nitride electrode materials. We thin them down and passivate them with biocompatible plastics. 
The chip itself is only 1.2 by 1.2 centimeters. But again, 15 microns thick. So it's, it's, its volume is something on the order of two cubic millimeters. So how much function can we get in such little volume? Well, a hell of a lot. 65,000 electrodes with all the neural stimulating recording, data conversion, wireless powering, 100 megabits per second ultra wideband radio transceiver with all the antennas integrated, a complete system in this tiny little volume. So what other kind of interfaces can we build into bioelectronics? How about a full fluorescent microscope in a needle that can be inserted into tissue or a surface imaging device? Shall I show some examples of these in the bottom left here? So in addition to image sensors, we need integrated light sources, filters, lensless imaging, all of which can be integrated on a CMOS substrate, producing a device that is thinner than 200 microns in the case of the surface imaging device, but also mechanically flexible. Organic LEDs shown here in the bottom, bottom center um, are also a convenient way to monolithically integrate light sources of many colors, and this can be done on, e on, on CMOS. That's another example of more than more. The imaging sensors themselves can move beyond simple photodiodes that we use in cell phone cameras to be things that are called uh, single photon avalanche diodes that can detect not only that I've received a photon, but when it's arrived, creating a new richness of information. How small can we make these implants? The top right is one of these. This is the size of a dust mite. It's about 300 microns on a side. So we integrate a piezoelectric transducer. This is a material that converts acoustic energy into electrical energy. And we communicate and power this device using ultrasound. The same integration of piezoelectric transducers can also be used to make wearable ultrasound imagers, a very small form factor. This moat can be used for all kinds of sensing, and it can be an injectable device. Can we go even smaller? So in the bottom right, I show a 10 micron device. This chip is actually inside of a cell. In this case, we use light to power and communicate with this device. This is actually a, a small algae cell, and we're using the chip to study the intracellular environment. We sort of trick the hapless cell into thinking that this chip is food and it brings it in in the hope of consuming it, and it winds up floating inside its cytoplasm. So I'm bullish on the prospect of CMOS technology to drive the future of new medical devices that are smaller, cheaper, more capable than anything that we have produced to date. Thank you. Right. Thanks so much, Ken. Great. Uh, next up is Professor John Rogers. Uh, John is the Simpson and Query Professor of uh, Material Science at Northwestern University. Um, I could go through all of his other department uh, appointments, but maybe I can just say not not history. <laughs> you haven't not joined history. Not yet. yet. We're uh, so across, across the board. Um, but uh, for years, John has developed new materials, new fabrication strategies uh, for soft bioelectronics, um, and with a, a sort of an eternal focus on translating this to the patient. So over to you, John. Great, great. Thank you very much for that introduction, Paul. And I should thank DARPA for their funding over the years. It's really been critical to a lot of the research that we've done. I've been pretty active in this space for about 15, 20 years or so. Uh, I'm at Northwestern University at this point, got my career start at Bell Laboratories, in electronics, fiber optics, that kind of thing, moved to University of Illinois for a number of years, and um, uh, now, now transitioned to Northwestern, primarily motivated by an interest in getting our engineering efforts more intimately coupled into a medical community, uh, a ro very robust one that we have. Uh, at Chicago, in Chicago, uh, not, not only through the medical school at Northwestern, but the broader medical community in Chicago. And um, as uh, Paul mentioned, I have appointments in a number of different departments, so we do things very much at the system level, integrating multiple uh, you know, types of expertise across uh, traditional engineering disciplines, but we're also tightly coupled, as I mentioned, in that medical community. So I run a group, but also an institute uh, at, at Northwestern that, that really pr uh, provides some enabling resources to, to allow us to operate effectively at the boundary between engineering science and, and, and medical science, up to very high levels of uh, TRL, uh, and you heard a little bit about that. So all the way probably from TRL 1 to 7. Uh, and then we're very focused on uh, translating the most successful technologies that emerge from our, our research uh, in, into the real world. And so I brought toys. If you're, you're interested, you can, you can find me, show a few devices. I'll step through um, you know, the major uh, research themes that, that we're pursuing with it within our institute. It's the Query Simpson, uh, Simpson Institute for Bioelectronics. It's endowed, so we have funding from the usual federal sources, DARPA included, but we have uh, a quite, quite a large amount of philanthropy and foundation support. 
uh, as well. So starting in the upper left, uh, we've been interested uh, over the years, I would say more generally, in you know, the material science challenges of uh, reformulating kind of man-made microsystems technologies into biocompatible platforms, platforms that uh, adopt physical properties matched to soft tissue systems of interest across the human body so that that kind of high level of functionality in those microsystems, not only uh, electronics, you heard from, uh, from um, uh, Professor Shepard about uh, CMOS technologies, but, but also optoelectronic systems, photonic systems, uh, microfluidic lab on a chip type devices that, that can persistently interface with, with the human body, uh, supporting two way exchange. So, sensing and also actuation, delivering uh, therapies. So, starting in the upper left, we've been interested in classes of uh, you know, electronic and elect optoelectronic systems that adopt uh, thin, mechanically flexible forms for integrating on, on the surfaces of, of tissues. So, so, not only the skin, that, that's a relatively non-invasive uh, point, point of interface, but, but also uh, the surfaces of internal organs as well. We've done quite a bit of work on brain interface devices, devices that interface with the bladder, the gastrointestinal system, the uh, peripheral nervous system, the spinal cord uh, as well. And the image you're seeing there is a distributed array of uh, electrophysiological sensors and stimulators uh, distributed across the uh, epicardial surfaces the, uh, with the ability to map electrophysiological behavior and also stimulate in very complex uh, complex ways. But as I mentioned, those same kind of concepts in material science, you think about it as extreme heterogeneous integration. It's not just mixing and matching different classes of semiconductor materials, but bringing hard inorganic electronic materials uh, together and blending them in, in this hybrid uh, way with uh, soft uh, organic materials as well to, to support kind of the uh, compliant mechanics that you ultimately need. So not just flexibility, but also uh, stretchability. And so that's an example for um, you know, an implantable device of, of that type, but, but we're also very active in skin interface devices. And so this is one of our most mature systems. It's essentially an, an ICU uh, on, on a patch in, in a sense. So FDA approved for all vital signs monitoring at ICU grade quality, initially uh, sort of geared around uh, neonatal care, so uh, vital signs monitoring for uh, premature babies, essentially, but also deployed now for pediatric care and for monitoring of uh, maternal and fetal health. We have about 15,000 of these distributed uh, across 20 countries, uh, you know, uh, across the globe, even in the most uh, resource-constrained areas of the planet, Zambia, Kenya, uh, and Ghana, for, for monitoring uh, purposes. So, so that, that's kind of one example. And just mo moving through the, the other uh, different, different cases here, we have injectable systems with microfluidic functionality, ultra miniaturized sort of mini, uh, millimeter scale wireless uh, wearables. A couple of frontier ar areas that we think are very uh, uh, interesting, not only from a material sci science standpoint, but from also a clinical use uh, case uh, standpoint, are uh, illustrated in the lower uh, left and, and, and the middle lower, lower frame. Uh, the one on the left is showing um, you know, a class of bioresorbable electronics, so uniquely defined by the ability to support high uh, performance electronic functionality, but in materials that are uh, soluble in, in biofluids, two biocompatible uh, end products. And so you can imagine these devices being deployed uh, and designed so that their operational lifetime matches uh, a biological process, such as a wound healing process. So it's there to monitor, deliver therapy during that healing process, but after the, the wound is healed, internal wound, for example, the device naturally disappears uh, through, through bi bioresorption, thereby eliminating the need to uh, go in and, and perform a surgical uh, extraction. Then thinking beyond just integrating with, with surfaces or point locations in, in the depths of tissues, we've been uh, working on distributed open 3D architectures uh, of electronic, optoelectronic systems to try to integrate uh, through three-dimensional volumes beyond just surfaces, another kind of frontier area that I think is pretty exciting. And then the last example is one in a, in a lab on a chip type platform designed to interface with the skin. And I have an example of one of these devices here. Uh, it interfaces with, with the surface of the skin and captures microliter volumes of sweat that, that, that emerge as a result of action of the eccrine sweat glands. And in this particular example, we have colorimetric chemical assays for various nutritional biomarkers that are present in sweat. Uh, for this device, it measures uh, the, the concentration of vitamin C, zinc, calcium, and iron uh, in, in sweat. And again, very high uh, TRL level for this device as well, fully deployed in commercial, uh, commercial forms with a, um, with a partnership through, through Gatorade. And so I have three of these patches. You can uh, buy them at any Dick's Sporting Goods store. It measures a uh, sweat rate, sweat loss, and electrolyte loss. You put it on your skin, you capture an image with uh, an app that, that runs on, on your cell phone, 
uh, and then it essentially tells you how much Gatorade you need to drink to replenish <laughs> the lost, uh, lost sweat. So, so I have three of these. The first three people who approach me after this event, uh, I'll give these away. So uh, it's a $15 value, actually. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you got to move quickly if you want it. So anyway, thanks again for thanks. inviting me to participate in this panel. Yeah, thanks, John. I, Although I imagine the answer from Gatorade is you need to drink lots of it. More, beer. more is <laughs> always better. It's more, good yeah. stuff. Yeah. Not enough. <laughs> All right. Uh, thanks. Uh, our final panelist, uh, Rick O'Brien. Uh, Rick O'Brien is a senior distinguished engineer uh, with the uh, with Medtronic, a world leader in the fabrication of implantables. Um, he's been working on uh, cardiac implantables, building and sensors um, into many of these platforms, and really the the range of devices that Medtronic has developed uh, to improve uh, se um, patient health has been uh, astounding. I, I was amazed and the, all the new things. Over to you. Well, thank you for that kind introduction, Paul. I'm honored to be here, and I'm really looking forward to the discussion. Um, so I'm blessed. I, I get to work on uh, multiple programs that are kind of those once-in-a-lifetime programs. Uh, it's a really rewarding field to work in. Uh, I, origin I currently work in our cardiac rhythm management business, which is the business that develops uh, devices to help you when your heart beats too slowly, if it beats too quickly, or in a disorganized fashion or for some patients, the heart doesn't beat in proper synchrony and you don't get the proper uh, output. So those are the primary products in our systems. Um, and so what I was gonna do today is just touch a little bit on the, on the history of, some, of the pacemaker, which is how Medtronic started in the implanted business, and those technology vectors that allowed us to improve over a period of time. And then how when I came in and started to work on implantable sensors, it actually served to start to accelerate some of the technology vectors and enable us to change kind of a paradigm in terms of how we do therapy devices as well. So the original uh, implanted pacemaker was done in 1958. Um, it was not done by Medtronic, it was done by other people. Um, but as you can imagine, 1958 technology is pretty crude by what we're used to today. And let me just tell, explain to you how crude it was. Um, so the first device, basically, the electric circuit design was taken from a metronome circuit design. So basically just steady rate of, of, uh, of pulsing and when you, the effect was is when you implanted that device, the physician would adjust the, the heart rate that you would have, and that was the heart rate that you lived with as you proceeded on with that pacemaker. And so that doesn't answer a physiologic need. So as we move around and the heart rate goes up to answer your body's demands, these early devices wouldn't meet that need. And so that was addressed eventually in a very clever fashion by putting a microphone uh, on the device, and you would listen for footsteps. And so the more frequent the footsteps, was a surrogate for physical activity. And so then the device could automatically adjust its pacing rate based on footsteps. <laughs> the device was also rather large. Uh, it was encased in epoxy to protect the electronics. Um, it doesn't last very long in the body. The epoxy seems like it's a good idea in an immersed environment, but it doesn't protect uh, against the aggressiveness of the body. Uh, and the device was very big. It was about the size of a hockey puck, which meant that it was implanted in the abdomen. And so basically the rule is um, the size of the device dictates where you implant it and you want to implant it in a, in a location that's tolerable to the patient. Um, so there was, you know, these drives, adding sensors to titrate the therapy uh, to physiologic needs, miniaturize it, reduce the power consumption. Oh, by the way, those early devices lasted weeks. Um, so they were used in patients that would die if they didn't have these type of devices. And so very limited utility, but these technology vectors of reducing current drain, improving power sources, greater longevity, greater reliability, uh, physiologic sensing, those were the vectors that basically drove the whole adoption of implanted active med medical electronics. And so the paradigm emerged, if you take a look at all those devices on here, you have a can, and today it's, those cans are made out of titanium. Um, it's got the power source and the electronics, and then you have leads coming off of those devices. And so you put the can, today most of them are up in the upper pectoral area, and then you run a lead to wherever it is you want to go to provide the stimulation. Um, and so that paradigm was established and allowed us to uh, develop neuromodulation uh, systems as well as some of the uh, other cardiac devices. And so it turns out when you start to do implantable sensors that it accelerates those things. If you have an implanted sensor, you want to turn it on more frequently. You want to communi communicate more frequently. And the other thing is, if it's not delivering a therapy, people want it to be very small. And so if you, that insertable cardiac monitor down on the bottom left um, is a device that's about, I think it's one third the size of a AA battery. It can be implanted in 60 seconds from skin to skin. You just make an incision, insert the device, put a stereo strip on, you're done. 
Um, and that device provides a wealth of physiologic information, um, posture, uh, uh, heart sounds, uh, activity, as well as all the electrical measurements you can get from an ECG. We can detect respiration rate, respiration patterns, and the list just goes on and on. And so what we're working on doing is trying to give the physician as complete a picture of the patient anytime, anywhere, that will allow them to make medical decisions. And then as we matured that technology, we realized we could port it back into our therapy devices. And so that small little pill by the pacemaker uh, label, it's about the size of a vitamin capsule. It's eight tenths of a cc. So we can take all the uh, functionality that goes into the pacemaker that's next to it. The can is about 13 cc's. We can put it into that little pill and implant it directly in your heart. And why that's significant is it cuts the complications from a uh, transvenous pacemaker in half, which is a big boon to the patient, big boon to the healthcare system, because the complications can be quite expensive. So with that, I, I think it's time for the discussion. Yeah, thanks, Ray. <laughs> All right. You see the, the, the QR code up there? Please send in your questions. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> so um, we were talking earlier uh, about CMOS, and you were, Ken, talking a lot about just the capability that's being maintained and sustained. And, and one of the major things that we're doing in, in MTO right now is we're trying to take advantage of what commercial industry is going to maintain and sustain for commercial applications, but but do things special on top of that through through heterogeneous integration. It's a, a major push for my office. Can you talk a little bit about what when, when we think about heterogeneous integration and the specifics of that as it's applied to the body for in vivo sensing? You know, what are the big challenges that you see and, and maybe even some, some thoughts on the opportunities? Yeah, so I think, um, well, we're trying to progress to a point where we can simplify what gets implanted so we can be as volumetrically efficient as possible, kind of remove the can, <laughs> if you will, and get to the actual, put the actual electronics directly into the body without all that extra stuff. Um, that involves, and then also removing useless volume, right? So a chip, so one of the things that we were doing, I showed was thinning the chip down, right? The substrate doesn't perform any useful function. It's just, it's just wasted space, so get rid of it. And then it also gives the chip some flexibility. So, I mean, you need to integrate electrode materials. You need to um, put the chips into form factors that make them more, more amenable to be inserted into the body. For example, thinning them down, making them flexible. Um, if you're, if you're using other means of transduction, like ultrasound or light, you need to incorporate those elements as well. John can say more about this. He, this is one of his areas, right? More things, passivation materials that you have to put on top of the CMOS to not only protect the chip from the hostile saltwater environment that it's in, but also make the chip more acceptable to the body as a foreign body response. So all those, a lot of those things can happen at a wafer scale and can take advantage of the the uh, economies of scale of microelectronics, but and, and use maybe the similar ideas, but they're definitely obviously a different application space. And John, you're I, I see that some of the work that you've done as is really a, a bridge. We have this, you know, perfect crystalline electronic system. We have this organic system. We're trying to get these things to work together. You're you're sort of bridging that gap. Can you talk about the challenges that you've experienced through that path of how do we get from these crystalline structures of we built our electronics around, but they need to interface with biology? Yeah, I, I think it's a great, great question. I mean, you think about long-term in vivo monitoring, you immediately think about, okay, I need to worry about the biocompatibility of the materials themselves just from the standpoint of the chemistry, and, uh, and that, that's an important, important aspect. Um, but, but also the, the geometry, you know, and, and, and the mechanics as well. And I think that's kind of what, what you and, and Ken are both, both getting at. And, you know, a, a silicon wafer platform is a spectacular, you know, piece of technology. It's a, it's a, it's a wonderful type of substrate for the kind of, you know, fabrication schemes that are used in, in modern integrated circuit technology. But, but it's completely mismatched from the soft, curved, you know, time dynamic surfaces of the body, whether that's the skin or, or, or internal organs. And so you really have to try to overcome uh, the, those constraints associated with, with the wafer. And, and I think Ken's done some wonderful work in kind of thinning a wafer. And that, that gets you to a format that, that can be very flexible. You have to worry about mechanical robustness. You're still sitting on silicon. And so, so I think that that's a, a great step in that, that direction. But, but you know, this is a problem that we've been working on, as Ken mentioned, for, for a long time. And I think you know, flexibility is, is one thing, and, and that's great. Obviously, your, your skin flexes. Uh, but, but your skin has a geometry that can't be accommodated by a platform that simply bends. You, you can wrap cylinders and cones, but you can't even wrap a sphere, much less the heart or the brain or even curved 
surfaces of the body. So you really have to think beyond flexibility to something that, that not only flexes but also stretches as, the, as defined by linear elastic response to large strain deformation. And that strain may be in the range of 30, 40 percent depending on where you are uh, across the body. And, and not only linear elastic response to large strain but low effective modulus match to the uh, tissue uh, that, that you're interested in, in interfacing with. And so the skin has a modulus of maybe half a megapascal, a few hundred kilopascal. The brain has a modulus much lower even than that. Depends on which re region of the brain, but maybe five to 20 kilopascal. And then, so, so then the challenge in heterogeneous integration is how do you build a silicon technology that's soft at that level? You know, that, that's a pr pretty daunting challenge. And I think that, that difficulty has led many researchers in this space to abandon silicon and, and move to your know, networks of carbon nanotubes or thinking you're going to do something with 2D materials, graphene or molybdenum disulfide or maybe organic semiconductors. And I think that's great academic research, but, but if you go down that pathway, you've, you've divorced yourself from this tremendous engine of progress, right, around, around silicon. And so, so we work that angle, but but uh, for, for a number of years, but, but kind of switched to the question of like, how do I blend silicon with soft materials in a way that allows me to leverage the state of the art in CMOS, but, but at the same time achieve these biocompatible physical properties. And, and it really requires mixing soft materials and hard materials where you're designing the hard materials in, in geometries that provide an effective level of stretchability when they're embedded in a soft elastomer, for instance. And so you can imagine, um, you know, uh, engineered buckled structures that, that allow you to do that. So a thin sheet of silicon is not stretchable, but if it's wavy uh, in, in that kind of buckled shape and it's embedded in elastomer, so suddenly you can stretch it back and forth without any uh, fracture-inducing strains in the silicon itself because it's behaving like an accordion bellows, right? And so you build on that simple engineering concept and you can develop elaborations that, that, that are quite, quite advanced. I mean, th th this device itself is, is very flexible and, and stretchable, almost matched to, to the properties of the skin, in spite of the fact that we have batteries, right? And we have, you know, component level uh, bare dye uh, ICs. It's be because of this blending. So like from a material s science standpoint, you think about it as like a, a composite material structure, but it's deterministically designed with full, you know, quantitative 3D finite element modeling of the mechanics of how this thing deforms. And so now you think about circuit design in the traditional way, but layered on top of that is mechanics design, where you're thinking about the layouts and the choices of materials to get the mechanics right. And so, so th those are topics that we've wor worked on o over the years, and there are a set of rep recipes that, that work pretty well and align with commercial manufacturing that, that I think create some exciting opportunities for deployment. Now, Rick, we... Um we were talking earlier about this idea of, of, of the challenges that you were, were talking about as we face over history. And I, I can't help but, uh, you know, when you were speaking, I was struck by this concept of you sound very eerily similar to the challenges that we face in the DOD at a platform level when we're talking about, uh, you know, uh, interconnected systems and its command and control and its persistence and power and all those sorts of things. Can, can you talk about those were the original problems for biosensing as well, and as it's evolved, those continue to be where we where we fight at. Absolutely. Can you talk about a little bit about where we are today in that space and, and where you think we're headed? Uh, that's a great question. Um, so today, most of the devices are designed around a specific disease state, and not even considering other implants. But the the sad reality is, is uh, people as we get older, especially in the United States, people develop more and more comorbidities. So there's a, in fact, sometimes the dev there are people have two implants for two different disease states. Mm. And as I said, basically the, the devices aren't designed to interact with one another, but they, we do do testing to make sure that they don't interfere with one another. But as you go to smaller sensor systems and as you want to sense things that perhaps you can't get from the thorax, maybe from the peripheral limbs, you can envision systems where you have devices talking to one another and coordinating with one another. Um, so that's an area that uh, I'm really uh, interested in pushing forward. Um, as, as was mentioned earlier, there's various ways that you can communicate uh, with a device in the body, and it all depends on how deep it is, how small it is. Um, and if you're trying to communicate to another implant, you don't want them both to burn a lot of power. So there's a significant amount of challenges, and I think that's one of the frontiers or paradigm changes that's opening up as a result of the miniature devices, is to entertain the possibility of multiple devices that interact with one another. It's been tried in the past, was not successful, but I think 
uh, we're, in an, we're in a point where we're going to have to do that. That's really interesting. And it is very analogous to something Bill Root was talking about earlier today, the services providing services to each other in this multi-domain fight. It's, it's almost the same, same thing, but at a mm -hmm. different scale. You know, there's, there's only, we, we communicate in waves. There's only so many waves. So, right. you know, what do you, you know, it's, it's acoustics, it's RF, it's optical, unless we're going to make physical connections. Mm -hmm. what, are you, what are you guys seeing in that space um, as to where, where could new innovation happen? Those things have been around for a long time now. What, what are the opportunities you think in, in uh, communications within the body? So I'll take a stab at yeah. it. Um, so acoustics is very popular, right? So you have an ultrasound machine and it's very, very useful and gives you a good image of what's going on inside the body. Um, it doesn't transmit well through bones. And if you uh, trying to transmit through the lungs, you don't have anywhere near the signal you need to do. So you need to have a acoustically transparent path. Um, and so that's what's keeping acoustics from uh, becoming more ubiquitous. Um, we don't use acoustic communication in our devices. Some other people have tried to do that. So we rely on RF. So if I have two devices in a sub-Q space, the RF will actually propagate very nicely uh, through the sub-Q space. And when you go deeper into the body, um, you know, our, our claim to fame is we detect very small uh, electrical fields within the body. So we inject current, create a small electromagnetic wave, and uh, basically communicate that way from device to device. Um, and some of our competitors use very similar technologies. Are you guys seeing anything in academia from a, from a comms uh, perspective? I know a number of folks have come and talked to me about things, but are you seeing anything new in that space for in, in, intra-body comms? Yeah, I mean, we, we work quite a bit in that general space of multiple devices distributed to different body locations communicating with one another. So one example, supported by the Ryan Family Foundation, for example, is to um, mount IMUs at strategic locations across the body of an infant and then use the full body kinematics that results from time synchronized uh, you know, time series data from, from each of those devices um, with appropriate AI algorithms to do uh, neuromotor assessments to look for developmental delays at the earliest possible moment. Because if you detect that early, then you can exploit brain uh, plasticity and there are various kinds of rehabilitation processes that, that, that are effective. And so in that case, we're probably oversampling, but, but it's part of a study. I think we're 500 babies into it at this point. So we have 12 devices. So one on the chest, one on the forehead, two on both of the limbs kind of distributed across. So, so in that case, we have a, um, uh, a master uh, device that's receiving Bluetooth signals from, from all of the other devices. And uh, the clocks are being uh, coordinated uh, and shared in that way. And so, so it's not too bad, but, but it's uh, imperfect because the, there are uncertainties in the way the Bluetooth stack works. So you can do time synchronization to within about 10 milliseconds uh, without long-term drift if, if you do it, do it that way. But, but um, you know, if you want to do something similar, um, you know, multiple measurements across the body in the context of hemodynamics, for example, 10 milliseconds is not good enough. You lose all of your resolution uh, associated with that time uh, uncertainty. And so there you probably want half a millisecond. Can't do it with a standard Bluetooth stack. So, so that's going to drive you know, some alternative. Maybe it's communication yep. through, through the body, as, as was described um, you know, by, by Rick. Um, or you know, the other uh, alternatives, you, you can have very high precision quartz uh, clocks in each of the devices, so you don't need to share that master clock. Everything is coordinated at the start of the study, and it doesn't drift appreciably through, throughout the, the time frame of interest. So and That's a technical challenge, yeah, a big technical challenge. Yeah, and, and power consumption becomes an issue there. Got, got to run the clock and, and, and so on. So, so that, that's kind of one context where, where we've been, been pretty active. And another one is sort of pairing implantable devices with with skin-mounted devices uh, where, where you're using other kinds of uh, you know, RF uh, communication, typically kind of in the HF regime, so may, maybe megahertz, because you can avoid absorption of, of water uh, in that way. And, and one example of that is we have one of these resorbable wireless uh, pacemakers, temporary pacemakers that's implanted, interface with the epicardial surface of the heart. And then we have one, one of these patches sitting on the surface of the chest, measuring SCG uh, and ECG, and delivering power and stimulus signals to the pacemaker as necessary. And so that's a kind of communication that goes beyond just data sharing to actual power transfer. Mm -hmm. And there, you know, that kind of megahertz uh, frequency range is, is much, uh, a much better choice. Another thing, comment to make is that the imaging and implantables can be combined. 
in imaging, you, you send energy into the body, and you basically you endogenously get uh, things reflected back at you. If you put implantables in, very small implantables within the body, they can interact with the imager in a similar way. Well, the, the implantables will be powered by the, the, the same energy that you're using to do imaging, and they can modulate and send information back to you in the image. So combining implantables with imaging, I think, is a, is a really useful you know, future here. And it, ultrasound is one convenient way to do that. So those implantables I showed you with ultrasound are designed to work with an imager. So when an ultrasound imager scans over those things, those implantables basically transmit their information back in the image. And so you can see biogeographically where they are, as well as them transmitting information back to you. And so I, I think there's probably lots of opportunities to do things like that and combining imaging and, and sensing in this way. So just a, um, just a couple into that, I, I spent a lot of time uh, thinking about this idea of how do we enable remote sensing. It's, it's the same analogy. I take the power with me yep. and consume it there. I, I beam the power down or I harvest the power from the environment. Can you talk a little bit about what opportunities are there? There's, there's energy within the body. Can we actually leverage that so that we can maintain and sustain a power source you know, from, from energy contained within us? Go ahead. Um, it's an elegant idea, um, and it's been pursued for decades. Um, glucose fuel cell, for example, yep. is something that people really try to pursue. Um, I'm not aware of anyone being demonstrated to lasting longer than a couple of weeks in the body, so the systems tend to break down. Uh, another one is mechanical energy harvesting. So if you're familiar with a self-winding watch, a lot of people aren't today because, because we do the recharge thing. Um, but you, there's a, you can harvest the energy of motion. And uh, the, when I first came to uh, the cardiac rhythm management group, we had actually licensed the technology from one of the Swiss watch manufacturers. The challenge you get is that, um, especially as you go into the miniature devices, um, a wristwatch is much bigger than what we want to implant to the miniature devices. And, uh, it works really well with the right environment, but as if you want it to be, give you adequate power in a sub-CC form factor, uh, be consistent over time, um, it t we wind up being actually to deliver a better system by using a primary cell and miniaturizing electronics. Um, other ideas have been thermal gradients within the body uh, using the Peltiers. Um, you don't have enough of a thermal gradient within the context of where the implants are located. There's not, a, not enough temperature differential to power it. So believe me, um, I'm yeah. actively seeking any way to get <laughs> our devices. Uh, you know, we, we have a goal of a device for life. Uh, so we're actively seeking ways to do this. Mm -hmm. well, we, we got enamored by this idea at one point too. And we, we played around with taking an integrated circuit chip and interfacing it with uh, ATP ACEs that hydrolyzed ATP and pumped ions mm -hmm. and used that gradient to power the chip. And uh, you didn't get a lot of energy density out of it. It, we, it was very, very challenging to do that. Yes. And of course, ATP is not, it would have to be something that would be in a cell, like I showed you that chip mm -hmm. in a cell. Right. Uh, but uh, we played around with those kind of ideas. But the energy densities that you can extract here yep. are very low and uh, it, it's very challenging. Yeah. Right. Yeah, we, we've worked in this space as well. I mean, I kind of would agree with Ken and, and Rick. It, it, it always sounds like a great idea, but when you start looking at the details of how much power you can, you can harvest and uh, the intermittency in many cases associated with that power creates additional challenges. And, and you might say, okay, I'll include a storage capacity in my device to smooth out that intermittency. Well, then you have battery, right, <laughs> essentially. Yep. So yep. why not just build a bigger battery or something like that to you know, compensate for, for energy you could have otherwise uh, harvested. So we've done a fair amount on, you know, I guess systems of the body that, that don't suffer from that intermittency. So the heart is always moving and the diaphragm, right? But, but in, and so you can put piezoelectric um, mechanical energy harvesters on the surfaces of the lungs, the diaphragm, and the heart. And we've done quite a bit of work on that, even in large animal models, so bovine, ovine models. But it turns out, so there's about a, a watt, I think is a good estimate of how much power is associated with uh, the cardiac um, you know, operation. Maybe Rick has a better number than I do, but the, let's say order magnitude, <laughs> maybe 10 watts, something like that. Anyway, anyway it, it's, it's a power efficient system. There, there's not a lot of free energy there. Right. So if you try to load up the surface of the heart with some kind of piezoelectric, which has a stiffness associated with it, you induce arrhythmias that you can't uh, recover from. So the amount of power that we could harvest reliably was like 10 microwatts. There's a lot of power sitting there, but if you load it up more than that, right. you cause all kinds of adverse uh, 
you know, outcome, so it's challenging. I think you know, harvesting from the surface of the skin is probably a lot more feasible. You have some temperature gradients there you can play around mm -hmm. with. You have ambient light that you can exploit, and we've been doing uh, the development of uh, uh, PPG units that don't require LEDs. You just exploit uh, you know, ambient uh, illumination, uh, mm. th things like that. I think that's probably a little bit more promising, in my view, for, from a practical standpoint. But these are challenges that, that maybe your DARPA you know, uh, initiatives yeah. Could, yeah. could solve. Because I think if you could, you could make it work, it would be fantastic, right? Body-powered devices. Sure. Yeah. So uh, one of the things I wanted to uh, ask is we, we've heard a lot of, about sensors that are biophysical in nature, and mm -hmm. some amazing right. words from Medtronic. I mean, but what other bits of information out there, what critical information um, about the body are we currently missing for the warfighter health? I know we've, we've been pushing in some of our programs, like can you measure uh, cytokines, like the, the body's signaling agents? And of course, uh, Medtronic with uh, like insulin pumps, have, uh, people right. have been developing closed loop, trying to track glucose levels. Like, what are the possibilities for like biochemical information, for instance? It's, uh, it's a tough problem. Uh, we've been pursuing it for some time, so glucose sensors uh, today lasts on the order of 14 days. It's a percutaneous little, on a little filament. Uh, you automatically insert it and it feeds the information to your insulin pump. Uh, so that's a paradigm that could work. Um, but again, it's very challenging because of uh, tissue uh, encapsulation of it, changing rates of uh, diffusion rates of the analyte that you're interested in. Um, and so uh, I'm interested in it. We haven't solved it yet. Uh, and then, of course, beyond the, the normal blood panel type of things, uh, as you said, cytokines, BUN, other things that are indication of disease state, uh, lactate, uh, we'd love to be able to do those on an implant for a long period of time, but we can't yet. Mm -hmm. Yet. Cool. Yet. <laughs> okay. yeah, I, or John? Yeah, we'll go first. Yeah, okay. yeah, I mean, I, th I think this is a great, great question. A lot of the sensors that we've been working on over the years have been sort of biophysical in their, the nature of their operation. But, you know, the body's a chemical system. You need to get deep right. insights. You really need those bio, biomarkers as well. The question is, how do you do it? I mean, getting access to blood or inter interstitial fluid, you have to penetrate the skin, all kinds of, you know, issues and, and infection risk, other things that are probably fairly severe for a warfighter given, given the environment that they're operating in, uh, highly non-sterile, I would say, in many cases. So, so maybe that, that could work. But, but I think getting access to, to fluids that are red, readily available, tears, saliva, sweat, we're very interested in sweat. Um, you can trigger the release of sweat at given time points. You can capture insensible sweat, which is always coming off the surface of the skin. Of course, if you're exercising, there's a tremendous amount of sweat uh, that can be associated with that. And, and so, so there are a number of different biomarkers in sweat. It's a very rich uh, bi biochemical uh, mixture in a sense. So, so we, we've kind of focused on uh, colorimetric sensors. I mentioned these nutritional biomarkers, uh, vitamin C, zinc, uh, calcium, and iron. But you can do rea uh, urea, creatinine. Uh, you could do lactate. You could do glucose. I think the unknowns are in how sweat chemistry correlates to blood chemistry. In some cases, there's a very tight correlation. Alcohol, caffeine would, would be two, two examples. Electrolyte levels, pr pretty, pretty well correlated. Glucose, there's a time delay due to mm -hmm. diffusive equilibration, so it's not going to be relevant for dosing uh, insulin. But I think it's, a, it's an underexplored class of biofluid that we and other, other groups are, are pretty interested in. And some of the things that get confound that are uh, environmental conditions, whether it's humid outside mm -hmm. or very dry and evaporation rates. Mm -hmm. um, that's the reason why the Google mm -hmm. contact lens uh, glucose sensor failed, is mm -hmm. they weren't able to accommodate those changes as well as tearing and things like that. Yeah. So too much yeah, noise. Yeah, but this, the multi-omic diagnostics are, have a lot of potential, right? And there's mm -hmm. a growing interest now in microRNAs, for example. There's a whole um, growing interest in what can be done with, with, with microRNAs that are all throughout the body. Mm -hmm. uh, and so they can provide a wealth of information about disease states and all sorts of other things, um, in addition to, you know, obviously proteins and, um, but, you know, so there's lots of opportunities here. The problem is how do you find a detect, how do you have a detection platform that doesn't foul, right. that, will, that will last over time? Um, you know, there, there's opportunities to do this stuff with CMOS. We can create great scale with CMOS, so we can imagine building lots and lots of sensors in an array at very high density. That kind of redundancy could give you a lot of robustness for doing these sorts of things. So there's lots of opportunities there. So we've been looking at sort of trying to do these things at the single molecule level where you don't need large ensembles. You can do things more robustly um, because you're, 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 you're temporally encoding the detection information. So it's more robust than, than amplitude-based ensemble encoding, which is normally done for biosensing. So I don't know. There, there's opportunities here, I think. All right. Fantastic. 
Well, uh, uh, briefly in the, the last minute, first I want to thank all of our panelists. Uh, it's been a great conversation. Thank you. Um, and lastly, wanted to make a, a, a small plug. This is the first half of the, the conversation, Bio to Bits, uh, in San Diego. If you could make it, we'd love to have you. Uh, we're going to do the other half. Once you've learned about the, from the body, um, what its current disease state is, what it needs, um, how do you go the other way? How do you go from electronics to biology, bits to bio, um, delivering therapies with the right spatial and temporal resolution, maybe to speed wound healing, maybe to interface with the brain, maybe to... Uh, restore healthy sleep, um, all uh, basically trying to give the patient greater control over uh, her or his body. So hope to see you then. Uh, thank you uh, for all your great questions. <laughs>